Welcome. I'm Harmony Slater, your host of the Finding Harmony podcast. Over the past 20 years, I've taught thousands of yoga teachers and students to explore the intersection between ancient wisdom and modern everyday life using mind-body practices to heal, awaken, and manifest their dreams from the inside out. This podcast is a sanctuary for those feeling overwhelmed by life's challenges. Are you ready to jump in and discover how these challenges aren't actually in the way, but are the way to finding harmony? Let's invite the magic back in. Hello, and welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. I cannot wait to introduce you to our guest today, who is a powerful force in the wellness space. She is an international yoga teacher, teacher trainer, as well as a regular contributor to Yoga Journal. She founded the Ashe Collective, which is an online platform that focuses on trauma-informed yoga, somatics, yin yoga, restorative yoga, and yoga nidra. And we're going to get into a little bit of the nuance, the differences between these different types of practices so that we're not collapsing them all into the same thing. They do have their own special tone or flavor. And she also has created an incredible space that's dedicated to healing through flowers and gardening and art and yoga with a special interest for renewal and transformation and social justice. I cannot wait for you to just absorb all the beautiful wisdom from Tamika Keston Miller. She is just an amazing woman. You're going to feel the Shakti flowing through her and what she's created both online and in person is just totally mind-blowing and transformational. She is focused so much on just trauma-informed yoga, ancestral remembering, the powerful uh, rebellion of taking rest, how that becomes a rebellious act in a world where we are constantly caught up in doing and producing and working, and also the way that she's supporting marginalized communities within her area, both online and offline. So I'm so excited about this interview. It was incredible. We could have talked forever. I know you're going to love it. And just another incredible entrepreneur who is so inspiring and creating wellness spaces virtually and in person, holding an incredibly accepting, compassionate space for people to come into. And I think it'll inspire you even to elevate your own business and your own offerings. And if you're looking for a program that can help you do that, I would highly recommend joining B-School this summer with Marie Forleo and myself. I will be holding my mastermind group in support of those who join B-School through me and supporting you in elevating your own business and creating wellness spaces that are inclusive, that are trauma-informed, teacher training programs, online, offline, spaces that really can help to feed your soul, nurture and heal the people that you've been called to serve in this world, and really up-leveling our collective community, increasing our consciousness, and raising the vibration. Let's do it. So head on over to my website if you'd like more information on how to join my B-School Mastermind this summer. And without further ado, let's jump into this interview with Tamika. Hi, welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. I'm here today with Russell Case. Good morning. You got to tell me all about this guest today. I'm so excited. I'm chomping at the bit. I got questions. I know you do. I am so excited too because... Our guest today is Tamika Caston Miller, who is so inspiring, an incredible human being, and I'm just so excited to talk to her. Hello, Tamika. How are you? Hi, I am wonderful. How are you two? Good. Is that like Caston, like the French, like Gaston? Gaston. Gaston. Yes, it? <laughs> it's Louisiana showing up. Okay, mm-hmm. so now, were you born there? Is that where you were born and raised? Is that where you're from? Is that where you went to school? So. Uh, I was raised in Texas, but I was reared in Louisiana. So if you're from the South, reared in... I was born in in Detroit, but reared in Slidell. Oh, what? (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Matt Slidell. First, first of all, only six people know where Slidell is. No, I'm just joking. No, all every she don't. She do not know where it is. She no, you couldn't point her out to a map. <laughs> what? No. Oh my gosh. Okay, so now my family's from D Quincy, which is this big. <laughs> And we always thought that the big city, which was New Orleans, not we, my family, they were like, that's where all the dangerous things happen. They're not wrong. That's where. All... <laughs> <laughs> so we so we were disallowed to spend any time in New Orleans. And then, of course, my daughter ends up going to university there. And I'm there like, and even I went to university. I got my master's from UNO. Oh, so oh, you and a blue, yes. wave? blue wave, the privateer, privateers, never mind. <laughs> yes, the privateers. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I'm like, here we are celebrating pirating. <laughs> yeah. That's how the city was made. <laughs> yeah, that's what's yeah. not I, in slavery. <laughs> I, 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 that. I moved down there, I moved down there when I was uh 13, and it, I was very much a fish out of water. But I'd gotten used to kind of my mom moved around all the time. So I was always a stranger wherever he was. When I moved mm -hmm. down there, it was just more of the same. So like a northerner who didn't know how to talk and then adjusted. And one of my fondest memories about the whole thing is that I graduated and I decided to go back up to school in Chicago. And mm -hmm. I saw I was in the south side of Chicago and I saw a brother wearing LSU colors. And I'm so excited. I'm like a <laughs> sweet summer child. And I ran up to him. I was like, are you from Louisiana too? And I was so excited. You were in the LSU because you're from New Orleans. You, oh my God. You, did you go to school there? And he looks at me like, what is this white boy? Oh, <laughs> motherfucker. Get the fuck away from me. And I was like, but you sounded like you're from Louisiana. Just like you, you legit. Yeah, like, I was excited. <laughs> And then I learned very quickly was that he actually from there. No, he was just wearing a color. I never no. found, he didn't talk to me. No, I found out very it, quickly in Chicago. You just there's there's a lot of more separation. <laughs> oh yes, if he were from Louisiana, that, that he would not have gotten that response. Yeah, if, no, we like, would have talked. We would have been friends. Yes, there would have been conversation. We would be That's going the to the thing. same bars and be having a good time. Yeah, they would have gone out for drinks, or would have found the place for hurricanes, oh, or I know. we watch the Saints something. games together, have a good time. I meet his family, we eat, I cook jambalaya yes, that, for everybody. Thing. Louisiana, full of racism, but everyone somehow still gets along. It's really weird. It's complicated, but it's <laughs> it's a Creole thing. It's a, it's a Creole thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So my family is from, they're from Louisiana and Mississippi, but we didn't really do the Mississippi side. So <laughs> it just, just, it wasn't there. <laughs> even though it was literally across the, just across the street practically, but we're like, nah, we don't really do that side. But so I grew up in Dallas, in a very bougie part of Dallas, North yeah. Dallas. Yeah. But then every summer I was with my grandparents and it was like, sitting out on the porch, eating crawfish from a bucket, mm -hmm. drinking sun tea, mm -hmm. lemonade, all of the great ants are getting drunk in the living room, you know, and just <laughs> that was that was my norm. And so I had this deep understanding of being like creolized and southernized. Mm -hmm. And then going to Dallas was completely different. You know, I would have to put on a different way of being to be there. Yeah. What's really interesting was that my Louisiana upbringing, because they come up, they're like, Ooh, we're like in the upper echelon of folks, which is mostly just because of like colorism and mm -hmm. that. But anyway, <laughs> they were just fair complected. Right. And fair creole. skinned. Yeah. Mm hmm. So because of that, they were just like, you know, we're highfalutin. We don't do country things, but they were definitely country folks. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I never really saw a difference between like Dallas and Louisiana, D Dallas and De Quincey until I realized I was like, yeah, they were pretty, they were pretty country. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then New Orleans, I didn't really get there until went to I went to grad school, and my daughter went to school there, and I was like, New Orleans is amazing. I love this. It's <laughs> Where's my life? A lot of life there in that yeah. city. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of culture that really yeah. has been hidden by all of the people coming in, just to, like drink and party and all of just so much culture and history there that yeah. unfortunately people don't get to. They don't get right. to know that part.
Yeah, but Mardi Gras, it's like a million and a half people come to the city for mm -hmm. that weekend. That's how people know the city. But actually, they don't get to know the city because the denizens uh, leave town yeah. and go yeah. you know, camp in Mississippi, for example, <laughs> over the mm -hmm. weekend of Mardi Gras because they don't want to be there for that. And so mm -hmm. the people that come there, it, it's almost like, a, like the campground uh, around a Grateful Dead show. It's its own city <laughs> of people. That's so accurate. And it's not at all like they don't mean it's anybody. like Burning Man moves yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's burning. And it's not, it's its own thing. It's got nothing to do mm -hmm. with the culture. It's yeah, I went to the New Orleans Center of Creative Arts. And so I was like immersed in the Marsalis brothers. Jason Marsalis was my like my uh, co-student. So I was like in that, I mean, that's the real nobility of the city is the musical mm -hmm. heritage. Yeah, it's really interesting how people just gravitate towards the fun, the the, the drinking, the vomiting. You know, I guess, let's just do like the worst <laughs> together. And they forget that the city was incredibly important to our, our history yeah. and, and the culture and all of those things. And hilariously, I've still never been to Mardi Gras. I've never actually done that. Now, I will say I've done St. Patty's Day. Because that in and of itself is pretty fun as well. Yeah. But I just can't do it. I'm just like, I don't want to see this city destroyed right. like this. Yeah. You know, but maybe Southern Decadence will be my next. It's a hell of a thing. That would be I, when I went there, <laughs> my, my mom and I, we were on our own. And we drove down there uh, in March, say, it's in 1992. Drove down there and we were going to get ourselves all packed in to Slidell. Like we heard it was Mardi Gras. We had arrived like Sunday around noon. And we, mom was crazy. Mom said... Let's go see it. Let's, we're going to go see a parade. It'll be nice. <laughs> You're like going to drive like, by like a zoo. Give us, and like see some, get some sparklers and watch mm -hmm. the parade yeah. like you would oh, in okay. Illinois. Yeah. And <laughs> in um, Illinois. we arrive and it's just like wasted Yankees, just like half drunk, like on the raft of the Medusa, like just dead, naked people just lying on the street. And then we finally saw one of those those crowds that form of white men with video cameras around a nubile young woman. And they're trying to convince her to take her clothes off so they can throw beads at her. No. So like every you like- saw that. You never saw that? So then every 50 feet to 100 feet, you get a new pocket. And it's all, it's like a, it's a scrum of men surrounding a young girl who's, oh, I'm gonna get some beads. Sure, I'll take my clothes off. And so, I was like watching boobs after boobs. I'm 13 years old with my mom, watching boobs after boobs with my mom. And I was like, this is crazy, mom. I'm not sure we're supposed to be here. So we decided like, to I'm leave. 13. I'm 13 and I'm with my mom. <laughs> Somehow and you we, knew this. We f almost got out. And then we said, and then there was one more crowd. And my mom said, okay, let's watch one more. And so I'm like, okay, we sit and watch one more and there's three girls and there's like the scrum of men with their video cameras and their beads, say 50, 40, 50 men. And the last one and two girls lift up their shirts and it's more boobs. And the girl in the middle decided, shit, I'll pull up my skirt. And it's <laughs> <laughs> full bush. I'm 13 with my mom watching full Also, push. is this the 70s? No, this <laughs> is 1993. It was, man, it was intense. Like you look, you start looking for it the rest of your life. It's like, when can I, I need to find full bush again? And, <laughs> and so I'm looking at it and it's like my mom and I look at each other. It's like, well, now we've seen that together. Yeah, mm. we're never going to the city what together a, again. What a wholesome, and, what a wholesome moment. But shit, you're right. We never ever <laughs> went to the city together ever again. In the next five years, my mom and I were never in the city at the same time. She went wow. by herself with her boyfriend. I'd go with all my wow. girlfriends or whatever. Never again did we go together. It's so interesting because mm. the name of your podcast is Finding Harmony. And I just think it's hilarious that... So there's all this mayhem, right? That this is a perfect example. I remember my daughter's first year at university. I mean, she wasn't there. She went to Loyola, New Orleans. I was super concerned two things that one, she was going to like turn into some raving drunk. And then the other was that she would never come home because I'm like, who would want to leave New Orleans, you know? And she was there one week and school hadn't yet begun. And she said, Mom, there are people drunk and hungover, passed out in their own vomit in the halls 
She said, by the way, they're all from Tulane. They're not from here. <laughs> That's the blue so, wave. It's the Tulane blue wave. <laughs> yes, because Tulane and, and Loyola are the two closest universities in the U.S. So all the Tulane people were like drunk and all that because the Tulane folks were wealthy and the Loyola folks had earned being there. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, I'm never doing that. And as long as she lived in that city, she did not drink. Wow. And I was like, wow. look at you. Look at you. I did that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and good job, she Mom. Still, yeah, right? <laughs> to date, she still doesn't, but she was just, it was almost as though she was harmonizing the space that she was in. And it's like, that's just definitely not for me. Yeah. And of course, she didn't, she didn't witness me ever drinking like that either. I wasn't, I didn't really drink like that either because I had a father who was an alcoholic. So I was like, yeah. I know how this story ends. I'm yeah. not really interested in that. So, yeah, that's it was wild. This is a weird thing to say. I stopped drinking. I went sober at 15. <laughs> I got clean at 15. <laughs> you got clean. Actually, it only sounds odd to people who aren't familiar with Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a Napoleonic I mean, it's, law. So you can go whole into the bars and drink. And it's on you if you get caught. It's not on the owner because that's right. how it, it's the reverse Napoleonic yeah. law. Yeah, it's wild. I don't know. I'm always just aware that I don't like being in those environments because I feel really unsafe in them. And so it was really interesting to have my progeny kind of figure that out on her own. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. But there you go. There's a Louisiana in a nutshell. I think we just summed it up. Yeah. <laughs> just joking. No, y'all, whoever is listening, that is not Louisiana in a nutshell. But you have this wonderful quote on your website, and Harmony really wanted to talk with you yeah. about it. And it's, it's really nice. <laughs> it's this notion that children of alcoholics, and I think all three of us can speak to this, may wear themselves out by being caregivers. And I wonder if you can if you can talk about that dynamic, why it happens that you overcare. Is it like the enabling of the parent? And I, mm -hmm. I know Harmony wants to talk about it as well. Yeah. I so I only became aware really of this propensity for caretaking to be a thing for children or for people who've been around addiction. Mm -hmm. I think that what ends up happening is, of course, we project so much, right? Like our whole lives we're projecting. And I think we're always learning. We're either learning by example or non-example. And for me, I had a father who was in, you know, an active addiction probably until I was about 21. And then he got everything cleaned up and he's sober now. But what I saw was just this kind of need for my mother to constantly clean up messes. Now, what that looked like in my family was financial messes, cleaning up, not showing up for this, that, or the other. And he was a very kind alcoholic. He was very jovial and all of that. I see now that was a way of metabolizing a lot of childhood trauma because he was also the son of a sharecropper. And now that I understand what that life looked like, I, I get it. But I was around a lot of alcoholism and there was always someone who was cleaning things up. My mother moved us away from all of that. When my parents divorced, finally, she went from uh, a, a stay-at-home mom to now a working mom trying to figure that out. Like, how do you get a job after 13 years of not being in the workplace. And so I think for me, what I just absorbed, even though I didn't realize it, was this picking up where people weren't showing up. I noticed that I would do that with the people who I was around. I would always give people chances to show up for their best selves, but then if they failed, then I would just clean it up for them. And it wasn't until a friend of mine, Sarah Ezrin, who's also a yoga teacher, she said, I unlearned a lot of that in Al-Anon. And I was like, what? This is a tendency from children of, wow. of, yeah. of addicts? And I had no idea. I just thought possibly it was just a people-pleasing thing, a middle child thing. I had all of these reasons for why this could be true. I didn't realize that it came from a sense of safety and just needing to cover up for other people. 
So, you know, and I'd married an alcoholic. Wasn't We weren't together that long, but my, my daughter's father was an alcoholic. And so even with them, I was constantly like, oh, he just isn't available right now, or he just can't show up right now, or he lives far away now, things like that. Mm-hmm. And so now in my old age, now that I'm mature, I'm just like, first of all, work with better people. And secondly, let people fail. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. <laughs> That's powerful, right? Because Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a tendency we don't want people to fail. And maybe it is being children of alcoholics or growing up in environments of addiction where there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of mm-hmm. covering up and shame and not speaking about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And so absolutely. it's definitely a trained, in, in yoga, maybe we'd say a samskara, right? It's a trained mm-hmm. habit to to cover things up and make everything look like it's fine and normal and functioning really well. <laughs> yeah, everything's great. Everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. Right. I did that for so long. I did that. I remember distinctly saying to myself and like committing to myself, Okay, I'm a single mom now, so I am going to work my ass off so that my daughter has a middle class upbringing. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't actually see that she has a different experience from her peers that have two parent households and all of that. So I'm just going to do that. And I did so much covering up and so much just working myself to the bone, working in environments that I wouldn't work in now that were very corporate, being around like you know, everyone's kind of like, what, OnlyFans? I'm like, no, I was around CEOs and CFOs and they were the worst of humanity. Oh <laughs> they were so much worse. They were the people who were very much like always trying to sleep with naive people and were always constantly cheating on their spouses and all of that or in the closet or whatever. And there was just so much lying involved with that. There was a lot of alcohol involved in those environments. I'm sure there was more. But I would just be like, I'm just going to work, work, work. And these environments that today I would never put myself in and today I would distance myself from because I need to make this amount of money so that my daughter feels like she has a normal life. Mm -hmm. And now I just I wish I would have been more in a visual struggle with her because I think that she would have had more realistic expectations of what life looks like as an adult. I've heard that with parenting, that it's often helpful to talk to your child about your struggles because it Mm -hmm. does help them normalize struggle. And so they Mm -hmm. don't feel wounded or out of sorts when it happens to them. Because we're all going to have struggles Mm -hmm. and we're all going to have problems. And I did so much tap dancing to make it look like everything was fine, where it's a common thing with black women to work themselves to the bone. And then when people ask how you're doing, they're like, no, I'm fine. Everything is great. And it actually has um, negative health outcomes for black women. So we die a lot sooner than our white counterparts because we're too busy masking Mm -hmm. what's actually going on. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not dying for that anymore. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go ahead and break. Not that I've died before. I mean, maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Anyway, but... (laughs) We died for that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I'm not going to be a part of this machine that just says it's okay to just kill yourself lying about how you actually are. Yeah, I I love that. And I think there's a lot of, too, past generational trauma that's being handed down, especially as a woman, (laughs) but like also as a black woman. And just even as a culture, when I think of like my parents and my grandparents and things that they went through as farmers, as Immigrants. immigrants coming to a country, it's there's a whole different kind of understanding of what it means to show up and work and just keep your head down and you don't complain and you don't, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not processing. Like feelings don't really matter. (laughs) Feelings don't matter. Your baseline of what you tolerate is just so high. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, no, I just kind of don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to show that to the people who are around me. I don't want people to think that's a natural default of, living dharma or living a a life of honesty or anything or like a spiritual life and now that i have grandbabies i don't want them to think that um struggle 
It's just like, I don't want them to see that as the norm, but I do want them to see hard work. But like struggle to just keep up with the Joneses and all of that. I want them to see a little bit of joy and play. I don't want it to be related to external things. So it's been really interesting just trying to find a balance of all of that and say, okay, my ancestors did it this way and I'm so grateful for them. And also I don't have to do that. I can, you know, as the Native communities would say, mend the hoop, carrying that forward, doing something a little different. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm. And I love this, something else that really stuck out, and it, it's connected. And I think this is something that it seems like in COVID, we all became so aware of, you know, nervous system and dysregulation in our nervous system and trauma and carrying trauma and micro traumas and big T trauma and in all capacities, but then also how we were dealing or not dealing with different things in our lives, in our present day lives, in our past lives, that kind of all really came to the surface. And, you know, in the Ashtanga Yoga lineage, we have Patabi Joyce is, you know, quoted over and over again for saying, practice and all is coming. And I love mm. on your website, I read rest and all is coming. <laughs> I think that yeah. this is so powerful. And I'm pretty sure in this conversation on the panel that we were doing for Yoga Gives Back, you said something to the effect of rest is a radical act of rebellion or something to mm -hmm. this extent. Oh, and I would this love you. Culture, absolutely. Yeah, I would just love mm -hmm. you to speak to the mm -hmm. importance mm -hmm. of rest, because I think it's so overlooked and it's so important like mm -hmm. to to actually process stuff too right like you can't process yes. stuff if you're not resting <laughs> right yeah I, I don't think people really understand how much we are constantly on in order to avoid feeling our feelings and there are a couple of things it's an act of rebellion for one for folks that come from cultures that really have been disallowed to rest i mean there's actual legislation outlawing vagrancy or you have things like that where it's like resting will literally get you Rest imprisoned yeah. arrested and sentence. imprisoned resting will get you arrested we yeah. did that together yeah um, but yeah i mean wow also but anyway yeah. resting will get you arrested so i was just thinking no wonder i'm caught up with this no wonder and then also just the like you were saying grind culture, you know, thinking that, oh, if I work more, I'll get more, work harder, play harder. Actually, it's just work harder. It's, mm -hmm. you're, you're not guaranteed any play on the other side of that. Rest and play have to be intentionally crafted and curated into your life. So I just think it's very rebellious, especially against late stage capitalism. And then on top of that, resting together then becomes a really revolutionary act. So I love this idea of just rest in general. I love this idea. I'm going to do it. Okay. But also like not yet rest. <laughs> I, I know. No, but when, like a restorative yoga, if the three of us were to take a restorative class together. First of all, I'll be the one snoring. But Me if too. we were to all three take a restorative class together, just think about it. Think about our histories. Think about our DNA. And we're just resting. That means I have to trust enough to rest near you, to rest next to you. I have to put down my guard. I have to trust the container that this is happening in. And there's a lot of forgiveness in that space. And it just and then there and there are no expectations. I also have to let go of the natural caretaker within me to be like, oh, did you need a block? Do you need me to share my blanket? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all those things just kind of have to go away. And I just, I really don't think people acknowledge that enough. And there's one last thing I'll say about it. And that is my best ideas have come when I'm rested. I always laugh and I'm like, man, eight hours of sleep. I can cure cancer. Bring it on. Like, but you actually will. If you're rested ideas. enough, you will defeat the little cancer cells in your body with your music. Also that. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Because <laughs> that's, that's the thing about adverse childhood experiences mm. and how having those high amounts of adverse childhood experiences, which are very much more common in, say, working class environments, how you can reduce your lifespan by 10, 15, 20 years because of the mm -hmm. inability to regulate stress because you're oh, yes. so used to it. You're, mm -hmm. You have such a 
tolerance for violence. Right. And so, and then like that, the, the violence in a, in a working class environment is so much more prevalent than mm -hmm. in an upper middle class environment. Like say, you know, you've got one guy whose dad works like my dad did as a welder. And then you've got another guy whose dad is a pastor, completely different household experience. A complete, one is going to be so much more inured to violence than the other one and have mm. then a much more different immune system, irregardless right. of ethnicity and how much, how fucking stressful that is just mm -hmm. walking outside. Ooh, that's just another layer. Yeah. That's just another layer. And then when you're looking at that, so I always say, okay, so when I was growing up, I was definitely, I didn't experience like poverty until I was in high school when my, the whole divorce happened. And I was like, Oh my gosh, wait, we're moving from our big fancy, you know, how like our, this life into the ugliest house that was available within the same school district type situation. Yeah. And so, so I, I'm blessed to have had the experience of both this kind of ideal huxtable experience, mm -hmm. but then also a real working class, impoverished making my own clothes yeah. background yeah, there. and then, you know, and now, you know, I'm back and living well, but those things, the people that I had to rely on, if I would have been in a different situation, those folks could have been predators. There are so many things that could have happened mm -hmm. just because you have to rely so much on so many other people just to make ends meet and to have people come through and help. You know, you don't know who that is, but for sure the layers of, I mean, I've witnessed it too, the layers of violence that are just in there, be it violent language or actual physical violence, all those things are just there. And what are we doing to A, acknowledge that, to, to even notice it, to raise our baseline of what yeah. peace looks like and mm -hmm. calm looks like, mm -hmm. and then to acknowledge that was totally different for our parents, because for sure, violence was a part of their reality, you know, <laughs> like domestic violence. And I just wonder what we're doing to shift the normalization of that with houses. But I will say this too, though, I think it's interesting that you've chosen a pastor. As interesting as the dy dynamics were in my house, my father was a very religious man and was sleeping with everyone in the church. <laughs> yeah. He's still very religious. Yeah. And so my thing too is I'm just like, There's opportunity I don't know there, if I'd there. agree with your example. <laughs> Maybe. I've met a Maybe couple pastors University like that too. That's professor, a, that's but I'm like, uh, that's the story of Krishna though too. Krishna is an enlightened being sleeping with everyone's wife <laughs> all over town. You know, every, I mean, these... it's the story of so. It's the story yeah. of Rod Stryker. It's the story of yeah. we don't. You don't have to go back that uh, far. You know, you, know? <laughs> you did that. You brought his name. Up. I sure did. No, I sure my did. I'm naming names at my age. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, good. <laughs> Well, Amrit Desai, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's so many stories of that, right? Yeah. I was. I, I want to go back to that. That you really painted a beautiful picture of trying to rest in a Yin yoga class, and how the layers of ethnicity and class inform the experience of trying to drop down into that mm -hmm. environment, and and how I often marvel at the risks that I took as a white male understanding the privilege that I had. I tell some cop off, or if I go travel to another country, or I go to someplace different, I have a kind of sense that things are going to be okay. I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get that mm -hmm. much trouble, which is so completely different for someone who's not a white male, that the oh, risks yeah. that you can yeah. take just trying to rest in a yoga room are a world away different. And we might be mats right next to each other. Yeah. So I'm also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. So they're the, like the intersectionality of the reality of what I'm bringing into a room or anywhere, really, any space I occupy are very, it's very interesting. So first I'll just say that 
I want to clarify that when I'm talking about rest, I'm thinking about restorative yoga. And when I'm talking about yin yoga, I'm actually thinking oh. about a space to place resilience oh, I'm sorry. and to process and use resilience for a good reason. And I'm, I want to ensure that I specify that because the thing is that, as especially as a Black queer woman, that's three layers of necessary resilience. And I live in Texas. So there's a four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Forgot so, the flag. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of layers there. So just to, so for me walking into a yin class, I'm already walking in with a lot of resilience. How can I use this in a way to re-embody, to place this somewhere besides just leaving it in my nervous system? Mm -hmm. But then the other thing about rest, you're so right. I mean, I could be resting next to people who are actively voting against my interests. Yeah who are out carrying tiki torches and creating harmful environments. They need to you know, relax like, too. <laughs> you know, and then going into a place like England, which had such a direct impact on the lineage of my family, or a place like Spain, there's a lot of spiritual abolition that has to happen in order for me to just be like, okay, I'm not just going to be angry at the British Museum. I'm going to acknowledge what's happening here and also speak truth to power and also maybe not glorify mm -hmm. what I'm seeing here. I just think that uh, there's just a lot of kind of unknown things that, yeah, we're all dealing with when we get there. And so to be able to rest with that is is huge. If I can rest with that, then I can also rest with grief, you know, a grief journey. I can rest with losing a friend, losing a job, losing status, because I have some skill, you know, yoga is skill in action, right? So I have some skill to be able to um, metabolize my feelings, metabolize my grief, to speak to it and all those other things. I, I just wish that people were a little more aware that when we're in a yoga space, especially in the West, especially when we have a lot of white supremacy that people still aren't necessarily naming mm -hmm. or speaking to, it exists within the studio itself. I've, I have experienced that numerous times, like just experienced white supremacy, experienced ableism, experienced hierarchy, experienced it from students and studio owners alike. And they and people don't realize that those dynamics are always at play in any space of privilege. Mm -hmm. And there and yoga is a space of privilege until it is made available economically, socially, socioeconomically, and literally located in neighborhoods where people exist that are on a lower socioeconomic strata, that those dynamics are always going to be at play. One thing, too, I wanted to speak to is that whole idea of being able to walk into a room and know that you're all right. I was telling someone recently, and they, their minds were blown. That was saying how, you know, I wanted to go to Ghana and, you know, told, I told my wife, I was like, let's go to Ghana. She was like, can we go to Ghana? And I was like, actually, let me Google. Yeah. <laughs> I can't actually, remember. I don't know. As a white man, I would assume that I can go to Ghana. There's no question. <laughs> but it wasn't the black thing because as a child of West Africa, yeah, yeah come on in. But as a person who shares a last name with another woman, yeah, different. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. You know, yeah. and then friends who are like, hey, let's go to South Carolina and let's go do that. I'm like, I'm not going to South Carolina. I'm black. They just barely took the Confederate flag down there. Just I'm not recently. going there. Yeah. Yeah, and mm. people just don't realize that these are things that are in the back of my mind. Yeah. Am I safe in this space? Mm -hmm. Am I safe in this space? Which identity isn't safe here. People talk about the man and the bear, but they're not actually talking about and thinking about all those other beasts yeah. that, you know, that someone that has an intersectional identity is thinking about in any space. What was that quote from James Baldwin? It's bad enough that I'm black. I'm also a queer and an, and an artist. And that's the triple threat right there. <laughs> And and being a at least he wasn't a woman. <laughs> that, that, that would have been even worse. Okay, there's your quad. or better, <laughs> depending on which way you look at it. 
<laughs> I know. Queer woman artist Audrey Lord. Yeah. Yeah. He also says it's challenging to be like awake and aware, you know, within the society, like black and aware, black and awake. I forget the exact quote, but, you know, all of those things. I just think it's really interesting that we're kind of not talking about those things, but they're there. And when we don't talk about them, we don't realize that people are dealing with this. So everyone just has access to love and light, right? Mm -hmm. Like love and light for everyone. Buy your, you know, your Shiva t-shirt in the lobby. You know, and it's just like, that's not people's realities. You know, we need to be more aware that people are walking in with a, a few more layers than that. Yeah. If you're not angry, you're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Then you need to rest to process your anger. <laughs> Slow down. Yeah, I just want to change some things. And I don't want to live my whole life mad because I don't want to die at the age of 48. Oh, yeah. Like things like that, you know, like also acknowledging that, well, let's see. Yes, I I want things to change, but they're not. Righteous rage is important when it is a conduit to action, right? But just sitting with that, I'm not trying to sit with that. I'm not <laughs> trying to have that in my nervous system. Right? Mm -hmm. I think it's such a dichotomy because you do want things to change and you do want to be in action and yoga is is skill in action and you want to do something about it <laughs> but also you can't just be in that space of internal violence right because when you're angry you're not actually hurting or changing anything outside of you you're only hurting and changing yourself and so you have to kind of do something to distill the anger so that yes. you can have love in your heart and then be in action and then do something about it and then go into the world and make the change right and it becomes love toxic, for yourself. Right? Yeah. Love for yourself. Like I love myself enough to not yeah. carry this rage. I love myself enough to not carry all of these things. Yeah. I'm going to acknowledge them. I'm going to do my part in changing them. But I refuse to hold all of these things. Because what what then is the difference between me and my grandmother when she was a mammy? What is the difference? of me holding on to all of the rage in the world than my grandmother taking care of other people's children. I'm not going to do it. If someone else wants to do it, that's fine. But for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to name things. I'm going to actively co-create spaces and ways for us to do things differently. Part of that means speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. And the other part is giving people a place to distill what is happening and to rest alongside it and eventually, hopefully, to rest without it, to be able to let it go. And that's where Yoga Nidra comes in, which is my third primary modality. Can we begin visioning something that looks totally different? It's not something that ever existed before. We're going to have to create this from a place of unknowing but radical imagining. So we can do that with Yoga Nidra, and we can now sit here and start creating a world that's never existed before. Mm -hmm. I love this. Tell us more about how you do that through Yoga Nidra, because I think when people think of Yoga Nidra, they think of like closing their eyes and falling asleep. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, yeah. that happens. Yeah. <laughs> that does happen sometimes. With Yoga Nidra, we have an opportunity to... So it is rest with awareness. If yoga is discernment, yoga leads to state of yoga, yoga is awareness. It's a set of practices that allow for us to unlearn and to remove, to deform what has been formed in order to then remember who we are and in order to reveal who we truly are, then we're dreaming with that, sleeping with that. Just as you mentioned before with samskaras and like bringing in these mind grooves or these memories, unprocessed memories that live in our psyche, it's really hard to create from a place of no memory. We're creating from a projection, right? Just like even from me thinking my daughter may not ever come home or might become a drunk or something like that. That was me thinking, oh, no, what if she follows her, the footsteps of her father or of her grandfather or something like that versus presuming that she was her own person, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I was thinking she might be like me and she doesn't drink at all or something, right? I was never thinking about 
her as her own person. So if we look at that, we look at Yoga Nidra, we actually have an opportunity. The guide has an opportunity to create space so that in this deep state of awareness, people can radically imagine. We can set an intention through the sankalpa of what our heart truly desires, or we could create one for the group or, or for the individual that's very intentional. But then from there, we can start letting our mind see it, experience it, actually be. I always talk about this is an opportunity for us to create or posit memories that don't actually exist. Mm -hmm. So now we're creating from a place of lived experience, even though we never actually lived it. It yeah. feels like a lived experience because we dreamt with it. We felt it in our hearts. So now we can create from that space. And I think that's what I'm actually doing right now through a very deep yoga nidra practice is creating this imagining that I've never actually seen, but I know is possible. This is also why I call myself a yoga futurist, because I'm like, we've never seen that before. So we're just making shit up. <laughs> you know? like, I think you're a we're... yoga shaman. <laughs> I love that. I the future is. That's amazing. Yeah. It reminds me of this that Gandhi quote, be the change you want to see in the world. And I'm just thinking about what you said about speaking truth to the power. And I feel like coming from that space of the embodiment of one of the good, the sat, sat, sattva, sattva, the embodiment mm -hmm. of peacefulness, and then being able to speak Tr truth to power from a place of love rather than a place yeah. of rage can be yeah. so much more effective because for me personally, like I, when I read Howard Zinn's uh, A People's History of the United States, what I saw is that on every page, someone spoke truth to power and then was assassinated very quickly mm -hmm. after. Like they were, you know, so like speaking truth to power is an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. Because you're going to mm -hmm. get, you, you know, you're the head sticking up. And it, that's scary. Oh, yeah. You know, I think about all the time, you know, people always, you know, laud Martin Luther King Jr. I'm like, he didn't die because he wanted to. <laughs> you know, he was literally, he was taken out. RFK was taken out. JFK was taken out. All these people. I think where we can be different and live differently. And people have said to me, you have a way of saying challenging things in a kind way. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, I'm not trying to be nice. I don't want to be that Southern genteel, just pretend that everything's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very much like, hey, this is an issue. And it's an issue for all of us. You know, this serves no one. How can we do better? Also, I'm not going to do the work for you. But we can we can dream together, we can vision together, and we're going to have to be in reciprocity over what that work looks like, because I'm not going to do this for you. But I think like leading by example with that and being kind and saying, so for example, I had a person who was very upset with me, <laughs> she was very upset with me because I wasn't saying what she wanted to hear regarding the situation in Gaza. Oh, yeah. And everyone's been upset. You know, there's just so much anger and rage. And I think it's it makes a lot of sense because people are now being like, oh, my gosh, this is happening. And I'm like, y'all, I went to school in Austin in the 90s. We have been well aware yeah, of what is going on for, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like decades we've known what's yeah. going on. But this is new information for some folks. <laughs> but anyway, there was a woman who didn't like that I wasn't mm -hmm. saying certain things or whatever. And I said, I feel so deeply that we are in this place of deep suffering and sadness together. Mm -hmm. And also, do not ever try to micromanage the way that I use my energy. Mm -hmm. As a Black, queer woman, mm -hmm. I am always in the work. Mm-hmm. You do yours. Mm. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. I'm not going to apologize for what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I am constantly creating communities of love, care, compassion for all people. Period. I am on the side of peace, love, care, compassion for all people. And I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to give hierarchies to it. And I'm also going to name that. And you better not even try to fix your mouth to have me do it a way that you want it to be. Yeah. Go do your own work. Yeah. If you want it to look a certain way, 
you go do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing yeah, to me that. how often people come to you and ask you to take a position on some fucked up thing you have no idea about. No one ever asks me to represent white men. And what? <laughs> so how are white men going to feel on this subject? No one ever has ever asked me that. <laughs> right? I think, could you speak for white men, please? We don't give a right. shit. Is that what you mean? <laughs> Whereas people are like, well, what does the black community say about this? I'm like, we're uh, not a monolith. We're not a, I'm like, right? I can throw a rock and hit a couple of people who I definitely don't agree with. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's a mess, you know, and I think really, it's just, we really want people to help, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we need to understand that work has to be from within. We each have to do our work and whatever you want to see. Yeah, you go create it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going <laughs> to do that for you. I'm already doing things. I mean, yeah. I think that's the other thing that I, in this very interconnected world that we live in, where everything's on social media and we're so aware of all the different conflicts and things going on. I think we have to take into consideration that people are dealing with their own lives. Like they actually have things going on in their personal lives right. that may be difficult to deal with. And they can't take on Gaza right now <laughs> as much as they care about it. Or yeah. are, but not doing it in a performative exactly. way. You know? Exactly. It's just, yeah. you know, it's also that. But yeah. if we move it from, because, of course, if someone's going to hear that and be like, rrr, rrr, you know, oh, whatever. No, I, know. I can tell you right now, <laughs> come at me and be blocked and be blessed. But even if it's like another, a, a, a totally different example, there's a person <laughs> that I knew who, you know, had a major, very public kind of meltdown yeah. and and then later we had a clearing about it and I didn't feel that you really showed up for me then I was like my brother had just died yeah, yeah. like mm -hmm. did you know didn't know did yeah. you even know that happened did you know that my brother and one of my best friends died within three months of each other yeah I'm like I had other things going on I acknowledge and appreciate how much you did and you were going through yeah. Um, and that's your shit. That's not my shit. Like yeah. everyone has their own shit, but guaranteed if that same person would have asked for a little help, I probably would have been like, you know what? I know that I'm in grief right now, but let me go show up for my friend. And I was just like, it's incredible to me how much we don't realize how much people are dealing with yeah. on their own. Like they're dealing yeah. with their own lives. They're dealing with their own sadness, their own anxiety, their own grief. Mm -hmm. And some folks have a lot of space to cope with all these things that aren't near to them because they're not coping with the things that are near to them. Mm -hmm. That's the thing is it's like, if you're actually in the work of your own things, it's really hard to be in all the other things. Yeah. But one of my friends who, and a trainer for Asha Yoga School, which is my yoga school, he's a, a traditional Chinese medical practitioner. And he said, in his very soft voice, he said, what do we do when there are all of these things going on in the world? What do we do? And people were like, I don't know, go do the thing, go do this, go do that. And he said, be happy. Because if we're all connected then your joy adds to the joy of the world. Your yeah. misery adds to the misery of the world. 100%. And I was just like, whoa, you know. And he wasn't saying don't be active, don't do the things. Mm -hmm. But it's like, don't hold what's not yours to hold. Don't carry what's not yours to carry. Yes, go make actions. Mm -hmm. For anyone who's going to listen and be pissed off that I didn't say the right thing, I'm not saying don't vote people out. I am not saying don't donate. I'm not saying all those things. Yes. Vote, donate, do the things, spread the word, spread information, do all the things. Take a and, position. And I'm also <laughs> take a position, you know, like take the take take something, say something. <laughs> and what I am saying is that it is not something for us to hold in lieu of mm -hmm. doing our own work our own work of healing, our own work of revealing, our own trauma processing, our own, all of the things. How many of us actually took time to process what happened for four years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. COVID? Yes. Or yeah. Trump. Like, Cause it, oh, God. Because <laughs> that was hard. Two, just, I just want to say, go I, haven't a, I haven't had a chance to really talk about it. And the Trump wave. I know. Can we have a support group? No. For, oh, right? God. Just, 
living in it's a post like Trump. The, when you said Trump's tiki post- torch, is, that's it. That was the what I. That's the emblem that I'm going to think of the Trump period. Is the tiki torch? Oh, you're when lucky because the emblem I think of is AR. 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 Sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, like like literally, I see just mm. I see so much violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That I'm just like. This is yeah, the, the world Texas we're governor in. just mm. fucking pardoned a guy who murdered activists on the street with his car, and so he brandished a gun, so I shot him. Like, you fucking ran into him with your car. I shot. I just my my wife was saying my wife is white and she's former military, and she was telling me she was like, I can't believe that just happened. Every now and then she has these moments of revelation of the world we actually live in is super <laughs> racist. Wow, <laughs> and she's like, that's amazing. I know. It's just like. This is horrible. I'm like, yeah, babe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome. You know? no, sounds like she lives in like the world I like to live in, which is like my own little bubble of like peace and harmony and goodwill and love. And I just, and then I hear these like little pieces of news and I'm like, what's trust, going on I in the world? To, I trust the uniform. I, can't, I, can't. I trust <laughs> the uniform. He, he's always, he's my news source. So he's like, hey. Ms. Ms. Tamika, I just want to ask you a question and we can edit this whole portion out, but I, and I don't know if it's something that you want to get into or not. So I just want to preface it that, that way. But I wondered if you would share with our listeners the the arc of your experience and how difficult these choices were for you to be married to uh, a man and have a child and then make that transition f- to where you are now to being out and married to a white girl, which is kind of surprising. <laughs> Not what I expected. He said a married. white girl. <laughs> a white girl. <laughs> A member, of, even, I'm, I'm sorry, a member of the military. A <laughs> member of the military. A freak and some tween that you picked up. Um, no, edit all this. No, I'm just kidding. No, I love this. No, this is, it's interesting. I was raised with, this is a very common experience, by the way, of like black folks that are from the South. I was very much raised with a don't trust white people type mentality. But at the same time, we were constantly aspiring to a lived reality of white folks. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that was really interesting. My family's Creole. So, you know, Creoles have a lot of their own colorism Mm -hmm. and a lot of their own, a lot of our own um, bullshit that we really just need to work out because of safety and because literally like being fairer got you treated better. And by better, like, not beaten on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) like for me, my journey has just been really authentic. I think that I very much just always listen to myself. So even going to university, that was my own journey. My parents didn't do that for me. They didn't even push university on me. They didn't even know where I was going. I was like, hey, y'all, I'm going to University of Texas. They're like, oh, awesome. Like, <laughs> they, they had no idea. I moved myself there. And I never went back to Dallas. When I was there, I loved languages and cultures. And so I was always around that. I was working to become fluent in Spanish. So I was always around other cultures. And that being always around other cultures showed me so much of just what I didn't know about the world. Mm -hmm. I remember having a conversation in my dorm with a Hasidic Jew. And I just remember thinking, I don't know any Jews from when, where I grew up Mm -hmm. and sitting there and just having conversations with him and trying to understand anti-Semitism because it wasn't something I I was raised with. We didn't have anyone that was like an out Jew or even an out Muslim. It was just only evangelical Christians, that reality, you know? And I knew that there was something wrong with that because I knew that had to look a certain way, but I couldn't really name it. So my first kind of awakening was through a very Latin American experience a very Jewish experience at school. And then I was just like, oh, I kind of am seeing that the world is different. So I think that because of that, I've always just taken people for who they are. And I've always been 
available to myself to expand because my mind, my frame of reference was blown at such a young age at 18. I remember being really pissed at my parents for not talking about racism more when I took my first African-American culture and history class. I was like, how did I not know this? This happened where you lived. Like, I didn't, like, and my mother was just like, I'm from a small town. And my dad's like, we don't talk about that. And I was just like, so there was just so much I didn't know. So fast forward, I married a Cuban who was an immigrant. And we only spoke Spanish in the house. And we had that whole lived experience. Had my daughter. Was he anti-Marxist? Is this being recorded? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> All Cubans at that time were members of the Communist Party unless they came to the United States yeah. and then they had to renounce that. Okay. But those ideals were still there. But I was in Austin. So like mm -hmm. Marxism was a whole thing in Austin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. still is. So anyway, fast forward, I knew that I was attracted to like all people. I wasn't interested in deciding I like you based on your genitalia first. That just wasn't a filtering system for me, but I didn't have a lot of mentors around me that kind of normalized that or named that. So later when I finally came out, which was at 30, um, <laughs> which was really interesting because at that time, now I have a 12 year old and I have to explain What's all of on? that, yeah. but she'd been around queer people. I've been around queer people since I was 15, but as an ally that I was in the community. So by the time my wife and I finally met, we were really good friends. I finally had a group of people who were around me who were like queer women. I'd always had queer men around me, but I, I always say I was raised by a pack of drag queens, but like... <laughs> queer women, that was important for me to have. And this entire time I was on my journey, uh, my spiritual journey, my yoga journey, and just my journey of accepting who I was. Just like, I don't know, this is who I am. Who are you? Mm -hmm. And we were really good friends. I never expected to marry a woman, but this year will be 11 years we've been married. And she's in her work too. I don't know that I could have married a person, a white person who was not in their work or who hadn't had a lived experience outside of a very small kind of unexamined reality. But because she's former military army, especially a lot of black folks there, a lot of queer women there, a lot of things to just examine and explore and also a war veteran. So a lot of kind of, there's also a lot of examination of value of life, you know, mm -hmm. seeing things from a much larger perspective. Wow. And we both are travelers and all of that helped. Mm -hmm. But it's the journey of authenticity that was definitely scaffolded through my yoga practice and through my own spiritual journey that led me to a very authentic life, which just so happens to include a white woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every now and then, though, we still have our moments where I'm like, I need you to examine this. You know, when we're in really challenging, we saw the Kahendi Wiley exhibit and it, I was like practically like, <laughs> yeah. and she was like, Incredible. I'm mad about some of this. And I'm like, let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah. You know. So things like that have been a part of that. I know that was a long, no, long it's road, beautiful. but I explained about yeah. 30 years. <laughs> no, yeah. Distill your life into 30 seconds. No, I think it's so beautiful. And I'm really curious about your yoga journey and how that fit in, because I feel like there's a lot like speaking about power dynamics and like coming into yoga spaces that are curated for, especially in Western culture. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll just talk about here because that's where... I think you came to yoga first, right? Like white women in leotards with very thin bodies. I mean, and how it's... eight dollar coffee in their hand? Yeah, how did yeah. like well, how did you come into yoga? <laughs> I was so I came to yoga way before that actually. So okay. I came to yoga in college at around nineteen, and I already had a breath work practice because I was a trained singer. I thought I was going to be an opera singer a long time ago, so I was a trained singer, and so I already had kind of understanding of breath work. So when I realized that breath work was like a, a practice, then I went into there, 
and just did like gym yoga and things like that. But it was just people at school. There wasn't a kind of an archetype that I noticed. When I started noticing archetyping was when I started doing yoga at home. And but my first teacher, if you will, was Rodney Yee. So even still, it was not like white women or like thin women, but it was a very flexible Asian man who would fall Mm. from grace many years later. Right. So on his own journey. Did you see Rodney Yee on Oprah? I didn't, (laughs) although I loved Oprah. Oprah was a part of my journey, too, by the way, because she was this big black woman who wasn't particularly pretty and she was brilliant. And I was like, Visible representation, mm, like, right? How important sorry? is that? Visible representation. Oh, yes. How important yes. is that, right? It was so important. Also, she is absolutely why I don't have a very specific Texas accent. Yeah, watch that show, yeah. I was like, I don't want to sound like Ross Perot. I don't want to, I don't want people to be able to name where I'm from. I want them to be a little confused. But anyway, so by the time I went to a yoga studio, mm-hmm which was years later, this was like 2008, 2009, okay. and yeah. it was a hot yoga studio. Oh my gosh. I was like, I'm the only one who looks like this. I'm visibly fatter than everyone else. I'm a little older. I'm black. There were no black mm-hmm. people in the studio. This mm-hmm. is in Houston. Like there should be black people somewhere. <laughs> like, I'm like, white people aren't even the majority here. But it was very, it was very not black. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that was interesting. But I will say that I was more caught up with my size yeah. because it was hot yoga. So you're wearing very little clothing. Yeah. So I had to really deal with that. It wasn't until later that I was like, it's ridiculous that there aren't other black folks here. Mm-hmm. And honestly, where it has really become horrifying is nowadays, mm. where we know that what we see on social media isn't representative of all people, but we have major yoga studios that are venture capitalist backed, that are putting bodies out there that just are like models that they're putting through teacher trainings or are just like people who are bendy former dancers and things like that and that are crafting a narrative of what yoga looks like and that's not what yoga looks like i mean go to literally any city and actually look at the bodies in the room Mm -hmm. and in 2024 they don't look like what you see on instagram so it's really not the studios inside of a physical studio that's the problem anymore it's virtual studios, it's social media, it's the Vogue effect, the Vogue yeah. magazine yeah. effect. Yeah. That's yeah. what's happening. And it's still saying, hey, look, this is what we look like. And it's like, no, it's not yeah. many level. It's just frustrating to see because literally I do not see myself ever yeah. in what is out there. Yeah. So I'm constantly the representation yeah and i'm just like come on y'all there are way too many black people in the world and in yoga there are way too many bigger bodied people in the world and in yoga for me to constantly be the one person occupying this space or whatever like let's do better yeah but they're but they're really like you can name the folks think about it if you think about bigger bodied black women we can name them we can all name them jessamine stanley Mm -hmm. diane bondi yeah there are your two. <laughs> are there any more <laughs> besides me? Like, where are they? Yeah. And they're they're but they're everywhere. There. That's the thing. They're just maybe not on social media. <laughs> right? Yes, because not everyone wants to do the labor. Yeah. Not everyone wants to do the labor of representation because it is labor. Just being on social media is exhausting. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> like it's not just like labor like in like representation it's just also it's such a job yeah it's, it's just such a job yeah that you it's... don't get paid for <laughs> i mean sometimes you get paid for it in okay. things yeah but <laughs> yeah. here's your water bottle or your supplements i want to say something that's just, it's tangential but it reminded me of something that you said just a, like a five minutes ago and you mentioned that you were a singer and you I was furious about the Nina Simone biography because they, they, in somehow in this sanctioned Nina Simone biography, they got a, a Lena Horn 
to play Nina Simone. And it speaks to mm-hmm. just how deeply embedded colorism and body shapeism or whatever. I don't know how the right way to call it. I like, love that body shapeism. Body I think shapeism. We're, gonna that, we're gonna add that to the lexicon. Like <laughs> you don't give me Lena Horn if you're gonna play Nina Simone. And it seems oh, like yeah. that's the one place where you would want a real representation, a real person, a yeah. real person. An accurate resemblance, an accurate mm-hmm. resemblance. Give me the nose. Give me the color. Give me the give me the whole body. That give me she the is. truth. Give yeah. me the truth. Give me the truth. And then you give yeah, me this. Yeah, that was give that me this. was a that said a lot actually. Yeah, and I love I love Zoe Saldana. I do. Sure. I think she's doing so much for just reminding people that Afro Latinos exist, mm. and. Nina Simone was very much a unique person who had a unique look, who was not someone who people consider traditionally pretty, Mm -hmm. who was not someone who is thin. There were all of these things. And it was an opportunity to actually, you know, be real. And glorify Nina Simone. Glorify. But I'm telling but people don't want that. People do not want real people Mm. not people i'll say that hollywood i'll say i won't even say hollywood i'll say that la doesn't want real yeah la doesn't want real i've i worked for an la based yoga company for the last four years the last year of which was fully you know interesting (laughs) and la wants (laughs) perfect let me just I'll tell you one one quick little thing mm-hmm. that was my wake up call. Back in th- Thanksgiving 2023, so this mm-hmm. past Thanksgiving, I was cooking and I was rushing because I don't like being late and I was already a little rush a little behind. So I was rushing and I was cooking and I wanted to make braised short ribs. By the way, not everyone who's in yoga is a vegan. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm making these braised short. I was like, if I can figure out how to make braised short ribs, we'll never have to dine out again because I love them so much. Mm. So I'm like sh- 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 rushing. Oh, it's an eight hour and journey, they... sister. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the oil's a little too hot and I'm just not paying attention. And I drop in a short rib a little too, with a little too much vigor. And the oil splashes in my face and neck and burns. I have this massive, like, my face is melting. This is Thanksgiving Day. It's a major accident. My wife is like, oh, my gosh, what are we doing? Like, first of all, we need to turn off the oil. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, go get burned stuff. Right. Right. I'm like, Mm -hmm. go get burned things. And I'm just like, you know, whatever. I look at my face after... By the way, dinner was still ready on time. <laughs> well, it was an hour delayed. Oh my but gosh. I look, <laughs> the people show up. I was like, I look like the elephant man. So I'm over here. I'm like, face is melting. I'm like, no, f- I'm fine. I'm fine. Like, talk about just the Jenner syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm like, no, I'm fine. No, face is like, Rrr. my family's just like, <laughs> they're like, but these short ribs are tasty. Anyway, I'm sitting here having this moment and I'm like, I can't work. Like I I can't work Mm -hmm. because my face. So I like tell my people, I'm like, Hey, look, like my face is melted right now. I can't, I can't go on camera. And we had a shoot that was coming up a month later. I'm like, I've got to get my face in order. I've got to look normal before the shoot comes. And that was when I realized that my career as a yoga teacher in that moment had nothing to do with my skill as a teacher Mm -hmm. and everything to do with me being able to be pretty enough to justify being on camera because if it were a studio I could have gone in and people would be like oh but it wouldn't have been a big deal but this is video that's going to live forever these are photos this is everything I'm already the big body person there's only one I'm already the only (laughs) black person there's only one so this face better show up right And then I remember just thinking, is it just me? And so I went and I got my face. I was able to get it together for the shoot. And I remember saying to the person who was running the thing at the time, it just dawned on me how much of my teaching, of our teaching, is aesthetic. Yeah. And she said, yep. 
She said, yep. Yeah. yeah. I was like, totally what does granted. this have to yep. do with yoga? Yeah. yeah. What does any of this have to do with yoga? None of it. Just demo. None of it is. Yeah. But, but that's what it's been reduced to, right? Yeah. How pretty are you? How jacked is your body? How many chaturangas can you do? Yeah. Not how much human growth hormone did you take to, to get there? Not how much ozempic are you taking to get ozempic. there? How much you're vomiting to get there? All of those things, they're all real. Yeah. Right. How much grape juice you're drinking to get there? Like yeah. all of these things that are really real. How is all of that mm -hmm. showing up, that diet culture, ED culture, eating disorders, so that oh, we can be pretty in it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying here. I'm doing my best. How am I <laughs> trying to show up here? It's got a lot of performance anxiety. No, no, I'm. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Also. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, on top of it all. <laughs> this makes Just the situation. This is show where a man defaults and where a woman defaults. You say ED, eating women disorder, are like, oh, yeah. Eating disorder. Dysfunction. <laughs> yeah, we are both, we're struggling, both of us. But yours only, I'm not saying yours, that, that only affects one person, whereas the other affects. Yeah, it affects anyway, the culture, right? No, it affects how we see each other. It directly and affects your ex my erectile dysfunction. Directly <laughs> affects your experience. It does. It's, it's it a, takes shameful. <laughs> but are you pretty enough to be on camera? No, she is. <laughs> no, I, I think I love that you're speaking into this because. I feel like you, when I started yoga, it was back in the day before yoga was really cool or popular. And it was TV. something that really helped me connect to my body and like practice in a way that felt like I was really nurturing my body. And for the first time, like mm -hmm. love myself and realize Loving that, yourself, right? Yeah, that my body wasn't something to just be abused and used. Exactly. But that it was like a, a vital part of like, my energy and my mind and like an integrative self and it was a very healing experience and somewhere along the way and I feel like social media has had a huge influence on this it's started to feel more and more performative mm -hmm. and the more performative oh, it yeah. felt yeah the more aesthetic and the more performative the more competitive the less healing and the less and the less the more harm yeah, the, the more, more harmful harm, it felt. Mm -hmm. It's literally yeah. actively bolstering systems of oppression. It is actively going in the wrong direction right now. Yeah. yeah. And all of that body love, I fell in love with my body through yoga. That yeah. is a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. As a woman living in a bigger body, Falling in love with myself and saying Vogue magazine's bullshit, Teen Vogue is bullshit. You know, I always say Vogue, Cosmopolitan, all those, they're all bull. They're all bull. These are all images. Number one, they don't look like me, so I don't have to aspire to look like that. They're not my, they're not like anyone I was raised with. Mm -hmm. I just remember feeling so confidently revolutionary in my body love, which was an aspect of my yoga practice and now it's like i don't know can i wear those leggings do i have a camel toe like <laughs> this yeah, is, right. that's a whole thing yeah. like i'm gonna be on camera is that gonna show up or does are my roles gonna show is this gonna show i didn't give a shit about any of that i was practicing in booty shorts and a sports bra in a hot yoga studio because i was hot yeah. I just want it to be less hot. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, let me make sure everything's all tight and da 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 because yeah. the camera is there. It's turned into a really harmful place. Yeah. And I just hope that people start naming it and doing better. But I'm frankly, I'm about to write an article actually about this. Like, as we move deeper into digital yoga, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Do we actually think? It's going to look like equity. Mm -hmm. Do we actually think there are going to be more black and brown bodies represented? Mm -hmm. Do we actually think that's what, it, that's not what sells. What sells is anger and skinny white says heteronormativity. So like, where does the not that exist within this landscape? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it seems too, then there are some other bigger body. I mean, it, it's, it, it's all around, but it just gets also sexualized, which is again, like this oh other, that's like this whole other oh, weird gosh, yes. avenue of yoga. So I looked at this account the other day and it's this Indian woman who, I don't even know if it's a an actual person to be honest because but it must be (laughs) but i was just like why every single photo is just like a huge crotch shot yeah like legs behind the head splits with your crotch like to the camera and like and yeah Yeah. okay so you have two million followers or whatever but what is going on here what does this have to do with yoga I mean, outside of... (laughs) I keep asking, I'm like, what are they selling? You know, every time I look at anything, I'm always like, what's the intended audience and what are they selling? Yep. You know, just the whole, the whole bit of it. You know, I get it. Instagram is very aspirational. That's like, Mm -hmm. that's what sells, right? Whereas Mm -hmm. like TikTok is unhinged and that's Mm -hmm. what sells. (laughs) But it's just like, I will take unhinged over that if that is what that needs to look like. But yeah. also, I think that until there are more images of people that aren't doing that, I mean, also just meditating isn't a sexy photo, right? That's right. That's right. I or know. even if it is, it's not real. Like, yeah. it's like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to meditate now. <laughs> after <laughs> like, after I like... diet for 30 days and sit on a beach <laughs> or overlook a mountain. Right. View. <laughs> or self care has to happen in Tulum or it has yeah, to happen in Bali. Manhattan. I'm yeah. meditating. <laughs> right. I have to wear the mala beads and it has to be like, okay, yeah. I'm spiritual now. Like, there's also that, that whole commercialized image of spiritual life and yeah. it's not accessible to anybody. It's just odd. And I just don't know where it ends, but I do know that I can get pissed about it or I can create what I want to see in the world. So for me, that looks like putting more of myself out there. I guess I'm going to keep being <laughs> the third and the trifecta of big black women. Yeah. We're grateful for the trifecta. <laughs> for your presence in the world uh, <laughs> it's, you know, but it's, I, <laughs> it's an amazing thing because like the essential problem that we're trying to fix with yoga is the ability to turn the phone off and we're using the phone to preach that message and so what? again the medium is the problem the medium of of delivery mm. is the problem in itself and so it's like rest getting you arrested it's like rest getting you arrested. That's exactly what it is. We come full circle. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. And the amount of actual, like, actioned skill one has to have to put the phone down is so much. I'm not that skillful. Mm-hmm. I am not that skillful. If I'm stressed out or I'm wanting to dissociate, I'm going to scroll. And yeah. I'm very just transparent about that. Like that is something I, I talk about all the time. I'm like, I used to be a huge reader. Now I just read social media. How has that impacted all? How's that impacted relationships also around us? But the Discourse. relationship to self, Yeah. the relationship to self I'm constantly just thinking, I find myself just getting mad. I can't believe that they put that out there. I can't believe that this account looks like this. I can't believe that they're normalizing this. I can't believe. And I'm just like, whoa. So now I've adopted my own little thing that keeps me sane, hopefully, which is don't get distracted. Keep going. Don't get distracted. So I might still scroll or whatever, but I'm going to be mindful of how that is affecting me so that I'm not, I mean, the the beautiful thing about being a a black woman in a bigger body is like, I never see myself. So like not being in comparison is actually easy because Mm. I've never really had a lot of mentors. Aside from seeing Oprah when I was growing up, it didn't really have, if she would have come out and she and Gail would have been in a relationship, that would have been amazing. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, come on, Oprah, just come out. Bye bye, you know, Stedman. <laughs> he's just wallpaper. But seriously, though, I never saw myself. So I will say that comparison has never been the, the thief of my joy. But I do acknowledge that if you do look in any way like the folks whose bodies are normalized, whose skin color is normalized mm-hmm. as normal and everything else is a default 
you know, that is creating a lot of harm. I get upset about it because at the end of the day, I'm a mama bear. And through my own work of not cleaning up other people's messes, I also acknowledge that it is the community's job to clean that up. It is not mine. Yeah. Now I'll keep putting my things out there. I'm going to keep speaking when I'm speaking. I'm going to keep sharing and I'm going to keep creating community and creating space. The community needs to get its shit together mm -hmm. because it's creating harm and it, it's bolstering and sustaining. It's giving platform for systems of oppression with a language of liberation. And that ain't it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I love that. Tell us, you've created the Ranch Houston and you have your virtual space, Ashe Yoga Collective, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell us how people can find you and work with you and what they'll find in those spaces. Well, you'll find <laughs> flowers. Um, so the Ranch yeah, Houston is flowers. a third space in Houston, Texas. We're an urban farm where we leverage... Um, we're, we're creating impact for LGBTQ plus and BIPOC folks to have a place that's not a bar, mm -hmm. it's not a protest where we can gather. We fund our impact through garden consultations, garden installs, and through selling our flowers. And then we also have retreats once or twice a year where we do art and yoga and really share the space. So that's where I'm living. That's what I do so much Amazing. of all the time. How, how many Ashe acres do you have there? Is it quite... Two and a half acres. So wow. it's a little micro farm yeah. for the Midwesterner over there. It's very small. <laughs> you got more land than we do up here in the cities. <laughs> Listen, but it's in the city of Houston, like wow. two and a half acres in the city that's of Houston. Lot. Horses all up and down the street. It's amazing. amazing. Um, I'll show Yoga Collective is actively working to disrupt the lie of sameness in yoga. It is a virtual yoga studio and yoga school that is empowering people to not only teach, but also lean into the subtler side and the yin side of yoga. So we really, we specialize in yin yoga, restorative yoga, and yoga nidra. When there is flow on the platform, it's more like slow flow, gentle, things like that. We just believe that your transcendence isn't linked to your ability to do a lot of work. One of the things we recently just started saying is Ashe Yoga Collective, we rest here. Lovely. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would love to see if people want to immediately create impact, they can join. Yeah. That's where they can practice with me now, or they can themselves be a part of the solution by going through our 300 hour and empowering themselves to teach trauma sensitive yoga to traditionally marginalized communities mm. so yeah so that's how they can support oh wonderful that's... it's I've, <laughs> I've looked at your offerings online and they look incredible so i well, hope that you. a lot of people sign up and where can people yeah. find them We'll have all the links in the show notes, but if yeah. you want to. Like, yeah. So yes. the website yes. and the Instagram yes. for those Asha Yoga dot com for Asha Yoga and the Ranch Houston for all things Ranch Houston. We really are hoping that locals will come and be a part of our things. We have like pride events and all sorts of things because we're so gay over here. Yeah. Like we're just, especially in the month of June, we're just... We are super gay and we just are loving it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Asha Yoga Collective is also super gay, but it's also a deep allied space. So mm -hmm. <laughs> both of them are. <laughs> you don't have to be BIPOC or queer to be in any of those spaces. We deeply care for and love our allies who are in the work with us. Calgary is so much like Austin. It's so crazy. Like you're in the middle of cow and oil country and then calgary elected a gay muslim black man as mayor what and it's it's just it's it, there's a lot of similarities in just how progressive calgary is compared to, mm -hmm. to austin maybe edmonton's a titch more progressive but it's Edmonton, you know, it's, really? As a hockey fan, I did not know that Edmonton was uh, so progressive. You know, Calgary is the sister city to Houston. Yes, oh, it is. That's right. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. I know. Yeah. That, yeah. We should visit each other more often. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I would love to go there. I've never been to Calgary, and I would love to go. I love Canada. Houston is going to be a, a little hot 
but yeah. I guarantee you will eat so well over here. We'll come <laughs> yeah. to the Calgary yeah. Folk Festival. We'll put you up <laughs> and you can see all the musical acts. They, they do an amazing event. Uh, I volunteer every year. And so I'll get you in there and you should come by. Yeah. I would love that. I would love that. Also, if you all ever do a yoga festival, like holler at your girl. Right. Love to see. I would. I would love to let people know. Hey, we're here. Yeah. Bye. Next time, I don't know when the next time will be when we're in Houston, but we'll definitely be looking you up. Coming by. Oh yes, and I would say that we would put you up here, but we turned a four bedroom home into a one bedroom home, but. We have like what I want to do with our house. (laughs) Listen, I was like, look, this is just us. We're creating a little, but we do have really deep relationships with the hotel around the corner. (laughs) And eventually we'll have a little space on our farm. So when people can visit, we can put them up. That's so So cool. We'd love that. I put you up. I meant this couch right here. (laughs) Yes. That's what I okay, well, if we're going with couches, yeah, I got yeah. you too. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank it was you. such a pleasure to connect with it's you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey, it's summertime and we have a fun summer challenge, a little game to play with you this summer. We want to get to know you. We want to stay connected and we want to see where you are listening to this episode of the Finding Harmony podcast. So wherever you are on your summer vacation, at the beach, at the cabin, or even a staycation at home, relaxing in the sun, maybe on your patio or by a fire pit, snap a photo, tag us at Finding Harmony podcast on Instagram. Instagram, and we cannot wait to see where you're listening to the Finding Harmony podcast and reach out and connect with you and say hi. So come on over, take a photo, post it to your social media, your stories, or a post tag at Finding Harmony podcast and let us know what episode you're listening to, what you loved about the episode you're listening to. I can't wait to see you and connect with you online soon. That's it. We've concluded another episode of the Finding Harmony podcast. I just want to thank you so much for doing the work that changes the world, starting with yourself. It truly does make a huge difference. Please make sure you have your automatic downloads turned on wherever you listen so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. I have so much more magic I can't wait to share with you. Lastly, if you're on Instagram, I love connecting and hearing from you. So come on over and say hello at Finding Harmony Podcast. And you can also come say hello to me personally at Harmony Slater Official. Thank you again for being here. I cannot wait to share more with you in our next episode.